The latest reports are that next season's replacement for Sergio Busquets will be, well, Sergio Busquets. At least, though, a much, much cheaper version of him. If he does indeed make 37 million euros this season, which is what's reported, and that's based on the inflated contract that was given to him by Bartomeu, next season, if he is renewing for that one year, plus an additional one year based on games played, at 3 to 4 million euros, well, that's basically an entirely different player. And much like as I've discussed with the renewal of Sergio Roberto and Marcos Alonso, I think these renewals say a lot more about the state of the club's finances than it actually does about the players themselves and the faith that the club has in them. Of course, Xavi and Laporta and everybody else around the club. If a player is going to renew, you're not going to say, oh, well, we could use somebody else. Laporta and Xavi mentioning a right back should tell Sergio Roberto how important he is to their plans next year, but he is still renewed on a much smaller number because Barcelona don't want to have to look for somebody who's going to ask for more money as the 23rd or 24th player on the squad. Same thing as Marcus Alonso, as those are two players that kind of accept their role as bench options, as veteran players for low numbers. And so the club has taken that. And if Busquets is going to do the same, that's, of course, why they're renewing him more than desperately trying to overpay somebody to try to come in and replace him, if they can even register somebody. Because registering a player you already have, even though, yes, I know Gabi Araujo, their renewals, it's a whole thing. But on paper, renewing players you already have is easier than bringing in somebody new to register. The tough reality is that Barca is still some time away from making moves for players, and they're stuck filling their bench with veterans willing to take pay cuts to continue to be a part of Xavi's project and, of course, live in the city of Barcelona. The other reality is there may not be that many options. As I looked over the summertime about those potential replacements for Busquets, well, a lot of those names are already gone. Because with the market and the money in the EPL and other teams trying to reinforce their squad, if Barcelona don't have the money in the moment, they have to basically re-scout and redo all their homework to find somebody new to play, and I don't even say replace Busquets, but play as a midfield pivot. Somebody who's able to play next to De Young if Xavi's going to go with that midfield four, or play next to De Young if he's one of the interiors, and you do continue to push Gabi forward as an inside forward with Pedri on the right. So I think a pivot is still desperately needed. And as the purist explains in some of his videos, and I know many of you watch his stuff, I think Barcelona are in need of that player. Not again to replace Busquets, to replace the function in that squad list. So now that we're just three months away from the summer transfer window, I did feel like it was an appropriate time to again look at some of those candidates and see what Barcelona can do to try to figure out some kind of contingency plan for a club legend. Player one is Sergio Busquets. I, I know, I know. I'm sorry for playing tricks on you, but of course, next year's replacement for Busquets might only actually be Sergio Busquets as a pivot position. As I said, the first pick is probably him because sticking around for another year and kicking this can down the road might be the easiest financial thing to do for the club. And here's the argument for it. I know you want to hear the one against it, but you know what the one against it is. Is that he's gotten a bit too old, they, they need to replace him for a younger model, and that Barca can't compete in Europe when they have somebody like him and his profile. As good as he is on the ball and all the great things he does, the club needs to begin to look forward. But the argument for him, would you rather bring in a player that Barca may be able to afford, but either won't be a long-term option due to age or isn't good enough to actually start over the summer? Or would you take one more year of this version of Busquets and get a much better option the next season when Barca, in theory, can afford somebody? The interesting thing is that we can all admit that Busquets at 34 has taken a step back from his prime in the last two or three years. I'm fully admitting that. Just using La Liga as a standard, he's played 69% of all minutes in Spain and been in the starting lineup 67% of games. Those percentages are all down in Europe and other domestic competitions, with the exception of more minutes in the Copa del Rey. So while it does appear that he's been in Xavi's Gala 11, he hasn't been relied on for those Ironman minutes that he was even last season when he was third on the team in minutes behind only Ter Stegen and Pedri. Three to four million euros is a squad player's salary and maybe that's what he'll be next season. I'm not telling you to try to talk yourself into Busquets for next season. I, just like you, would love to bring in a young, high quality pivot to take all or at least most of his minutes. But I am trying to explain why the necessary might not be all that bad for one year. The second player I want to talk about is Martin Zubimendi, because I was trying to figure out how to best organize the list of players that could potentially come in to replace Busquets if he does indeed choose to go to Al Nasser or into Miami, the two clubs that have been both most heavily linked with him. So I figure we break it up into dream picks, veterans, and unprovens. Yeah, I, I know I made that word up, unprovens. So instead, we'll just start with the one and only dream pick. That's Martin Zubimendi. 
He knows in Liga 3 Real Sociedad, ranks highly in world football in pass completion, interceptions, clearances, and aerial duels won. But the eye test has been helpful to instill some faith in him as well. He's taken that leap this season that people hope for him, adding consistency to the promise he showed for two years now. And like Busquets, it's not amazing assists or moments I'm looking for. It's consistent diagonal balls, retaining possession under pressure over and over and over again over multiple 90-minute windows. And to what I've seen, and I've watched Real Sociedad plenty, I think they have been one of the most enjoyable teams to watch in the Liga this season. I can tell you that, yeah, I've skipped a bunch of Elche matches, I've skipped a bunch of Cadiz matches, but Real Sociedad has been watchable. And Zubamendi, of all the things I've said that you'd hope that he does, he does to a really, really high level. And I think that's why he's probably not coming to Barcelona. 70 million is a release clause, and Barca won't be able to pay that before someone like Arsenal does. I'll be sad to see him leave Real Sociedad, but I'll also be sad to see La Liga lose another young player to the UK. Player three is Ilke Gundogan, and now we get into that veteran category that I was talking about, because obviously, Gundogan, not a young man. He's 32, turns 33 in October, and he's available for Manchester City on a free this summer. What makes him so intriguing is he's one of the rare players in world football that I can actually see being comfortable in multiple midfield positions under Xavi. And not just say on paper thing or we can believe that he can do that. No, we've actually seen a large sample size for him playing multiple positions in different roles, whether it's the pivot or we'll call it a destroyer or as a high interior. He's done it all basically through all his years with Dortmund and Man City and the like. I think he can play in the pivot next to De Jong and behind Pedri. But he can also play as the inside forward where Gabi is, or back up Pedri on the right if necessary. His age means he's not the long-term answer, but a two-year deal with a third-year option for $6 million, he's definitely still worth that. He ranks in the top 20th percentile in most attacking categories involving passing, and I think the fact that he's a top-level player at multiple midfield positions and he's available explains why he seems to be the pick. The only real question is whether he can actually take on the defensive duties of a pivot at Barcelona, Not entirely sure about that, but just like the Busquets thing that I argue, you kind of have to go with the best player available for next year and then kind of worry about what's available afterwards. Player four was going to be Inter Milan's Brozovic, but I felt like he wasn't possible. Like, it's just not going to happen. So instead, player four is Danny Parejo, whose name keeps popping up as an alternate for a lot of the names I'm mentioning and maybe even going to mention. Parejo is 33 and turning 34 in April. He's a poor man's going again in almost every way. He can play as a pivot, yeah, I guess, behind the forwards, and in a two-pairing or midfield three. But I've always felt that he needs some defensive cover himself, which kind of disqualifies him from coming in as some kind of Busquets replacement. If anything, Barcelona would sell Kessie and bring in Parejo to replace him. That's, that's how I could see both the idea of Gunnigan and Parejo being necessary over the summer. But I am also kind of nervous that I don't think he can possibly cover the space that Gabi and Pedri do as those high interiors. He just doesn't have that in his legs anymore. His contract expires next summer in 2024, so Barcelona would also need to pay something to get him out of Villarreal. That's why I'm not really sold on this. Even if he would take a huge discount in wages, at least I would expect him to do that at his age, to come to Barcelona, I just don't get this pick. Sofian Amrabat, yeah, he's a veteran, but not like the previous two, and he's not really unproven either. He's one of the only players who's really in their prime years, if you will, and his is a really tricky case, I think, too. He tried to move hell and high water to come to Barcelona in January, but due to financial fair play, it couldn't happen. He's only 26 and in his absolute prime. He ranks highly in all passing and game-changing categories as a defensive midfielder, and fans got to see the best of him at the World Cup. But that's where I start to get skeptical, too. Even though the World Cup happened in December, I still feel like Barca would be paying a premium price for a player who already showed you his best. Fiorentina fans have been pretty vocal about the fact that even though he's a regular starter in the midfield, his form and his club's form have been somewhat linked. The Viola has been average in Serie A this season, sitting 11th, and Emmerbat's form has reflected his teams. Valued at around $25 million, it may also cost something to get him out of the final year of his contract, which ended in 2024. Though the last argument in his favor is that the club has already established a relationship and agreeable terms to the player. So as I keep saying, convenience may be key, and that may also be the case in the case of Amrabat. With Alan Varela, we now move on to the unproven's. The first of two South Americans, Alan Varela, is a player that I have, for full discretion, watched in five matches in the last year for Boca Juniors. His transfer value is 10 million euros, and he has a contract until 2026, as he just signed an extension last August. Like many South American players, especially playing for River Plate or Boca Juniors, that extension usually doesn't mean you can't leave, but rather we would really like to get something for you. 
He's 21 now, turning 22 in July, and still feels like quite a bit of an unknown because he's played in South America, though he does play for one of the two biggest teams in Argentina, so once again, I've been able to see him, but I haven't really seen you know, the matches we'll say against inferior competition. It feels like only a matter of time though before he breaks into his national team, forever pushing that price tag outside of Barca's range. He's one of the best passers, especially from deep in the Liga Professional. And of all the players on this list, I feel like if you squint and close your eyes nice and tight, he's a player that most resembles Busquets. Again, when you're looking from a far distance, it seems like he looks like Busquets for better or worse. And from what I've seen, I think he has an innate ability to control the game from the pivot position. And I'd like to hear others' thoughts on how they think he would handle the increased speed of Europe and if that would be a problem. Five games still for me isn't a sample size I'm totally comfortable with, and it also seems that the club has moved off of him for a number of reasons. He's not really been in the news cycle for a while now. And that might mean that maybe Premier League clubs are already offering bigger numbers, which does make sense to me. Sticking with the improvements is Fabricio Diaz. So a little cheaper is Diaz, a 20-year-old midfielder for Liverpool, no, not that Liverpool, in Uruguay. The Uruguayan has a contract till 2026, but apparently the number to get him would be around 6 million euros. To be honest, I've always seen the same highlights and compilation that you may have, the ones that try to prove to us that he's a very vertical dribbler and passer and ball winner. More actually in the mode of Frankie de Jong, or even Pedri when he plays as the pivot, so not Pedri, but Pedri when he plays as the pivot in that two-man midfield, than Busquets. He isn't like Busquets almost at all, but he may not need to be. And ironically enough, I think there's a world where his timeline matches Barca the best of almost all the names on this list. If Busquets renews for another year and Diaz signs for Barca Athletic, as expected he may do to help himself transition from Uruguayan football to Europe, like Araujo did, that transition may fit Barcelona's timeline the best for the cheapest overall number. And having him register with Barca Athletic next season also gives the club a bit of wiggle room with financial fair play. I just wish Uruguayan football wasn't so difficult to find. Nico Gonzalez, and I guess there should have been another option that would have been in-house players, because I do want to talk about Nico Gonzalez. It's one of those, maybe the answer was looking for you all along, or the friends we made along the way, I don't know, whatever it is. But I think the last two definitely fall into this unproven category as well as in-house. You can mention others in lower age groups, but Kessie will start next season over all of those. So I know that there are U19 players or U18 players or even U16 players that you want to mention to me. Fair, I know the names, I hear about them, <laughs> watch my La Masia videos, you'll get a look at those. But for next season at least, Kessie will start over them. Kessie will also probably start over Nico Gonzalez too next year. But it does bring up a fair conversation as to why Barcelona wouldn't try Nico out and limit Busquets' role next season if they can't afford anybody. He's just come back from an injury and the next two months at Valencia could be huge for him. I thought he did a really good job in Busquets' spot in the preseason. I even got to see him live when De Young was being frozen out at center back. But Xavi saw something different than I did. At Valencia, that being for Nico, he's had some starts as the rotated backup pivot or one of the backup interiors. So he only started about 25% of games and played 27% of total minutes for a team staring down relegation. And his injury didn't help those figures, obviously. Numbers-wise, he ranks highly in all the pressing and passing categories you could look for at that position. But my main concern with him has always been his ability to control a game, or should I say inability, because I feel like he doesn't make the opponent go at his pace. And even out of Valencia, I'm still not seeing that and it still remains my primary concern with him. He just turned 21, so that may still come, but I'm not sure if Barcelona will wait if someone comes with an offer for him over the summer. To wrap things up with Marc Casado, and speaking of unprovens again, and speaking of what we might see over the summertime, Marc Casado has been really important to Barca Athletic this year, and he is only 19, but I'm not sure he's a long-term answer either. His 24-minute Champions League cameo was his Barca debut this season, and I can't imagine he'll get much more in the spring. To me, he seems like a less physical version of Nico, though I think he's even more comfortable playing a bit deeper where you'd expect him to go. However, he isn't necessarily a very good ball winner, even for his level, and his passing is good, but not elite. He does have those ball skills sometimes, but I don't see much consistency with those essential diagonal balls from deep positions. His close control, ball retention, and skillful footwork do indicate a future professional, but I think kool would be best to not put too many expectations on his first team Barca future. Alright, so I know that was a bit of a downer, but as I've come to expect, the viewers here on this channel or the listeners of the podcast, you know that I try to stay pretty tight wrapped into reality, and I leave those other Barca channels to kind of be more sensational and go at it as much as an upsetting as I can be sometimes. But I do appreciate you watching and like me, understanding that the bad times only make the good times feel that much better. So if you want to make sure you can join me for the good times, subscribe to the channel, 
give this video a like. And as always, until next time, Forza Barca.